for joining us for another uh, museum event. Um, we are chatting with my pal, Teresa McCullough uh, from Smithsonian's National Museum of American History. Uh, before we get started, um, reminder that please feel free to use the chat room as you wish as our virtual pub, our virtual tap room, your virtual museum gallery. Uh, share information, ask questions, do what you will, um, share what you're drinking. I just picked up uh, some beer for golf, Off Color Brewing, which is uh, basically um, a riff off of the Arnold Palmer. Excited to try that. Um, and yeah, just ask questions in that, in that chat room um, and uh, I'll pepper them throughout or we'll save them up for the end. Uh, but other than that, um, we're going to get this party started. Teresa, how are you? I am great. Thank you for asking me to uh, participate in your series. Hello from my, my bedroom in Washington. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Um, I'm excited to have you uh, join us for this. Um, one of the great things we've been doing with these events, and of course, that's the whole mission of the Brazium, is that we touch on all aspects of beer history and culture uh, throughout the world, through time, um, and, and, and personally, it's just so interesting to see so much of the remarkable work happening out there. And I think that what you're doing right now is really at the forefront uh, of um, something that's very important is making sure that we're collecting modern era um, uh, information. As someone who studied mostly, you know, 18th and 19th century American uh, brewing history, it's you know, if you're, you're studying any, any aspect of, of brewing history in the past, it can often be very frustrating um, that you don't have that much, right? And so it's so important to think about collecting in the present, um, present day. Before we get into all that uh, really fun, nerdy stuff, um, I would just love for you to tell everybody a little bit about yourself, uh, you know, where you're from, uh, where you grew up, uh, uh, you know, your career path and all that good stuff. Sure. So I was born in DC, uh, born in Washington, and my path has been a little winding to get to the, to the Smithsonian, it's where I am now, and, and uh, didn't necessarily train to be a, a curator of brewing history at the American History Museum, uh, but I think hopefully that's what makes it fresh and, and fun for sure. I, um, I grew up in Richmond, Virginia. Um, I studied Romance languages when I was an undergrad in college at Harvard, and um, and so my first job out of college was to work for the Central Intelligence Agency. I was a European media analyst. Um, the CIA monitors the world news. And so uh, it's not classified information. It's open source information. It's just in other languages. And so I worked in the Office of Linguists at the agency. And um, it was a great way to use my languages, but not creative work and uh, for the most part. And I had always been interested in food and cooking, food preparation. I think my language study had prompted me to travel, you know, that, that um, sparks a love of food and drink and, and other cultures. And so um, I wanted to explore a move into the food industry, I thought. And so I worked part-time in the evenings um, for free for a restaurant here in DC to work on the line to see what that was like. And then I uh, worked also for a pastry chef who made wedding cakes. She had a professional basement in her, um, a professional kitchen in her basement here in Washington. And then a third night a week for a food, food writer uh, who needed research assistance in French, um, looking at French language cookbooks um, and confirmed, you know, I, I was interested in this industry, but uh, how, to, how to get into it, I wasn't still quite sure. So um, I worked then for three years for Harvard University Dining Services and they have a, a program called the Food Literacy Project. It's a food education program. I ran Harvard's Two Farmers Markets. Um, also sponsored cooking classes, chef demonstrations. I wanted to go to culinary school, so I went to culinary school and got a culinary degree. Um, and by that point, I was ready to apply to grad school. I wanted to, to think about food and drink, again, more in an academic sense. So I um, went to the American Studies PhD program at Harvard and uh, studied New Orleans, food and drink industry in New Orleans in the 19th and 20th centuries. And so I relate completely to your experience of, of, of having archival sources ready for you when you walk into an archives, you know, prepared and organized in little boxes and, you know, working through things that, that someone in the past has already collected, has already organized and, and preserved and presented to you as a historian now, um, which makes the current, my current experience a very different, uh, but it was at, toward the end of my PhD program that this, um, 
this job ad popped up at the Smithsonian and um, they, the museum was looking for a historian who could ask big questions through the lens of beer, you know, about, about history and about identity and about um, cultural change and technological change, social change. And so it's been um, a, just a, a completely fascinating and fabulous experience to, to help build this new archive of the histories of home brewing and microbrewing and craft beer in the United States. And um, the American Brewing History Initiative, it's a program um, funded by a gift from the Brewers Association, which is the nonprofit trade group that um, promotes and protects small independent breweries. Um, they, they got together with the museum through the assistance, uh, the facilitation of Kim Jordan of New Belgium Brewing Company. And uh, the idea was that the Smithsonian had done such a, a good job collecting the histories of uh, cuisine and, and winemaking in the United States. We have Julia Child's Kitchen as this kind of the crown jewel of our collection related to food history. Uh, at the, if you go to the museum, you can see it there. But the question was, you know, where's the beer? What about the beer? You know, beer has run throughout American history since before America was a thing. And, uh, and there was a real sense that we could amp up our collections, especially related to this this current and ongoing phenomenon of, of craft beer. And so that has been my job for the last three and a half years. And by the way, when the Smithsonian announced that job, it seemed like everyone went bonkers. <laughs> right. Well, it was as intriguing to me as everyone else, of course. And, uh, and the morning the job ad was posted, my, my advisor, my PhD advisor at Harvard and a friend sent me the ad within five minutes of each other. And so I took that as a good sign that, you know, if I had the buy-in of my advisor and of a friend to think of, uh, of me in those different registers, you know, I, I, like, like others, I thought I would toss my hat in the ring and, and see. So. Yeah, why not? Yeah, um, yeah so I, it was interesting because it's sort of like the Smithsonian, which is, you know, the granddaddy of all cultural institutions in the United States, right? Saying for us, it's going to be important enough for us to hire a historian dedicated to telling this story of beer uh, at this time, right? That's some. That's kind of like the most legitimate situation. It's sort of like beer is having its moment. Well, that's been interesting for me to see that um, it's and it, this is not related to me. It's the it's the idea of the Smithsonian and the Smithsonian name, which is as interesting to me, you know, from a historical vantage point. Um, last uh, fall, I had uh, the pleasure of teaching a graduate course at, at George Washington here in DC. It was um, for museum studies students at uh, GW, and the class was museum history and theory. And so as part of that class, we studied the history of the Smithsonian, uh, you know, uh, just from its beginnings in, in the early 19th century, around 1830s. And, um, and yeah, as in many other countries, you know, the, the idea of a national museum means a lot of different things to a lot of people and has has meant um, ha has meant different things throughout history but the idea of collecting a national history I mean you know that's not it's a not unproblematic understanding um, but but the idea that that objects and and documents and voices that are of critical national importance I mean that's terminology that the Smithsonian still uses uh, as kind of criteria to understand what to collect and what to preserve forever. I mean, we, we, the Smithsonian never acquires anything. It's not a part-time commitment. You know, it's something that, um, that is meant to be preserved in perpetuity, as the institution says. So you mentioned uh, you decided to toss your hat in the ring. Like many other people did. So when you found out, what did that feel like? What, what happened? Was, what standing in a Target in Albuquerque, New Mexico. <laughs> so it was, uh, yeah, no, I, of course it was just incredibly exciting, but I was living across the country and my, uh, my husband was teaching uh, across the country at the University of New Mexico. So yeah, it was a, uh, certainly a very big gamble, but you know, it was just a, such a, a stunning opportunity. And, and so, um, you know, I, I moved across the country before, before he did to begin it. And uh, it was, it's been incredibly fun. So the other question, um, whenever your name comes up, is what what exactly does a beer historian do? What does Teresa's every day look like? And it's almost like anyone studying any sort of aspect of beer history, it's like you have that Indiana Jones sort of like stigma yeah. over you, right? Where 
it's like archaeologists are off doing all these incredibly adventurous things and, and it's all romantic and, and, you know, all kinds of goofiness when in reality, it's really none of that. Um, <laughs> but uh, there's a lot of research involved and specifically, I would love it if you could tell us a little bit about the American Brewing Initiative that is really the focus of your work at the Smithsonian. Well, so, and my first, so the first step coming into the museum, of course, was to understand what what was already there, you know, what groundwork had already been laid by uh, curators and, and donors of years past. And so the first step was really what, to understand what the museum already held related to brewing history. And so, um, so uh, you know, I found that we hold a, a, a pretty good collection of uh, 19th century and early 20th century brewing advertising material, sheet music related to beer, brewing equipment. Um, there's a, a particularly significant collection from a man named Walter Voigt. He was a Baltimore area brewmaster who um, gave a large collection of brewing equipment to the U.S. Uh, to, to the museum in the 1960s, um, but really beyond that, not 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 a lot. And so, you know, that was a, a, an intriguing and challenging opportunity to have really kind of a blank slate to think, well, you know, how how might the Smithsonian collect this history um, that you know I, I have dated the period from about the mid 1960s, you know, starting with Fritz Maytag to the present, acknowledging that the Smithsonian collects hopefully in a complementary way to other institutions. We're far from the only museum that is collecting, that should be collecting. We cannot collect everything, nor do we want to collect everything. It's not an encyclopedic approach. And so the idea is um, is, is more to design a collecting plan that's, that's thoughtful and, and respectful of what other collections are out there and to think about, you know, what are the kinds of things that the museum might might make best use of, whether in terms of, of, of research purposes, you know, offering these things to scholars now or in the future, but also for exhibition purposes. You know, I think most people associate Smithsonian museums with what's on display, you know, to, to visiting exhibits. And that's only, you know, it's such a tiny fraction of the collections that are, that might be on display at any given moment. But, um, you know, I think when curators collect things, they have to think through the multiple um, potential facets of, of uh, the use of an object or, or something else, you know, whether from a research angle, from an exhibit angle, um, and so to design a collecting plan that that was the next step and then um, and then travel, you know, you have to you have to go out there to meet meet people to record the interviews to have conversations to understand what to collect in the first place. Sure. So you've been at this for three and a half years or so right um, what what research have you been doing what's collecting been looking like. Um, can you tell us a little bit about where you're at right now. Well, so my my collecting trips, you know, again, starting with the blank slate, it's it's uh, uh, you know at the, at the very beginning of things, it was you know I was you know to think where to start. I thought I can't start anywhere else but at the beginning, and so the the first re research trip was out to the Bay Area of Northern California in spring of 2017, and that was to meet with people like um, Fritz Maytag from Anchor of Anchor Brewing Company. Ken Grossman at Sierra Nevada, Michael Lewis at UC Davis, um, Professor Emeritus of Brewing Science now, who has taught so many generations of home brewers and, and professional brewers in the region. Um, on that same trip, it was people like Vinny Chilurzo at Russian River Brewing Company, um, and then also a visit to Buffalo Bill's Brewery, which was one of the first brew pubs in the US in Hayward, California. Um, but then as time went on, um, you know, I, I, I was aware of other collecting projects and, um, and oral history projects like Charlie Papazian at the Brewers Association, who um, he did a wonderful series of oral histories, which you know he called the, the pioneers of craft brewing. And I knew that I, I didn't want to take a similar approach. You know, I, I wanted my project to be complementary and you know, not, not to go after the firsts and, and always you know, the person who's the, the founder or the head of a company. Um, but to think more about, you know, I'm trying to think as a researcher too, you know, it, it, you mentioned, you know, what, what, what would you want as a researcher going into an archive 50 years from now, 100 years from now? I think I, what I would want and what, what my um, hypothesis is based on, you know, the work of, uh, that, I, that I read and of others is, you know, I would want a kind of cross section of brewing, today's brewing culture and in a region or in a city. And so maybe that means, um, craft breweries that have been established for 20, 25 years in a particular place, but perhaps it's also people who have opened up two years ago and are experiencing the kind of competitive nature of today's um, brewing industry in a very different way. Maybe it's maltsters, maybe it's, you know, growers, maybe it's 
teachers and writers. And um, you know, I, I recorded an oral history with you because I, you know, I, I understood that your work in the kind of realm of public history and of communicating about beer and about brewing history in you know, spaces like um, pubs and, and streets of Chicago. I mean, that was very interesting to me too. So, um, so, so my approach over time has evolved to, to try to get at more of a cross section um, in different places. Um, have you had a favorite story that you <laughs> discovered or someone that you met that were like, man, that's just the, you know, that's, that's a, such an amazing story with an amazing person and you kind of like you're rooting for them after hearing about them a little bit more. I mean, hands down, my favorite part of the job, and I, I'm sure anybody on this call would imagine, it's, it, it's not hard to believe it's, uh, it's the people that you can travel and people give you the gift of their time and of, their, of sharing their experiences and being willing to be recorded. And so um, just the mind-blowing experience of sitting across the table from you know, from Fritz Maytag and Ken Grossman and Jack McAuliffe. I mean, that was a, a really incredible trip. I flew to uh, to Northwestern Arkansas almost a year ago, well, more than a year ago in spring of 2019 um, to interview Jack. And uh, he co-founded New Albion Brewing Company in 1976 in Sonoma, California. It's considered the first from the ground up microbrewery in the US. Um, Fritz Maytag famously purchased Anger Brewing Company in 1965. It was a, it was a um, long-standing brewery in San Francisco that needed so much renovation and help. And Fritz was just a, a total whiz at, at teaching himself how to brew and, and really making it into a place that inspired many. And among others, he inspired Jack. And um, Jack was serving uh, for the Navy in Scotland in the late 1960s when he started to homebrew. And he got really um, just entranced by the pub culture and the the beers that he was having there and and came back and said you know i'm gonna do this in sonoma northern california and so um but the you know the brewery is fairly short-lived it closed in the fall of 1982 and uh, jack left the brewing world uh, for a long time uh, until he collaborated again with jim cook from boston beer uh, around 2013 um but i knew jack was still here and uh and um you know, and so I was able to um, fly down and, and he was at that time living in a little cabin in northwestern Arkansas and, and record an interview with him. Um, but equally incredible to that, again, I, I mentioned co-founded. Um, he co-founded this brewery with two women whose names are not often mentioned as part of the story of New Albion. Um, their names are Susie Dennison and Jane Zimmerman. And um, they were two women who lived in Sonoma um, in the mid-1970s. Both were older than Jack, both had kids, um, they were in their, their 40s, and they supplied the funding that allowed Jack to open his little microbrewery. Um, he did not put up any money, they put up the money, and they helped him brew, they helped him bottle and, and, uh, and deliver the beer, and, um, and so actually the last oral history I recorded before all this started, uh, I flew out to Seattle to visit um, Susie Dennison, and Susie Stern, and uh, recorded an interview with her, and so it's, uh, it was that that was equally, if not in certain ways, you know, just as amazing to to talk to someone who was, uh, you know, there, to 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 find a kind of um, women very much at the beginnings of uh, of microbrewed and craft beer um, in a time when women are still in the minority of uh, of producers and consumers. So. Yeah, when you when I first heard that story from you, I was like, there were women involved in New Albion. What? <laughs> so it's fascinating that you don't hear about this stuff, which is why another reason why your work has been so important to this overall landscape of, of uh, brewing history. I think, um, you know, in, in parallel ways, but very different ways, you know, if I look at 19th century New Orleans history, some people are in archives and others are not. And, uh, you know, as a historian, you ask who is assembling archives and what's the context when they're assembling it. And, you know, who might not be there. And I've tried to be attentive to those kinds of questions as I think, well, you know, which voices would I like to be reflected on the record in the future for historians 100 years well, from now? Absolutely. Yeah, that's definitely a, a very um, significant point to make because who recorded what mm -hmm. um, is so important to the overall story because there's always there's going to be something missing depending on what part of the world you're in what's happening um there's a lot of context to it and and that's really interesting that that you mentioned that because and very thoughtful 
that your approach your, your approach has that in the back of your mind. Um, so you've been collecting, researching now for three years, traveling quite a bit, um, and uh, adding to the Smithsonian's collection, the National Museum of American History, right? And you just put together an, a little exhibition as part of the reopening of the food halls. Can you talk about yes, the Yes, definitely, yeah. And um, so when I, when I started work, um, there was no guarantee that anything that would be collected would necessarily go on display anytime soon. Um, you know, it's a, it's an, a very long and um, full process to, um, to get anything on the floor at the museum uh, d displayed in, in the gallery setting. Um, but I was very fortunate when I joined to be able to jump onto a curatorial team that was refreshing the food exhibit, which is on the first floor of the museum where Julia Child's Kitchen is that I mentioned. Um, and so um, for the first two and a half years when I, when I started at the museum, um, we, we reviewed every single object and image that was in that particular exhibit and, um, and revisited the entire script. But um, the team uh, turned a corner of the gallery over to me for, for beer. And so I was able to, um, to curate a new uh, section of this, the food exhibit, um, which covers the rise of homebrewed and microbrew beer in the US. Um, emphasizing the years 19, the 1960s through the 1980s in California and Colorado. And so um, it highlights the stories of um, people like Fritz Maytag, uh, like Michael Lewis, Charlie Papazian, um, Ken Grossman, um, Jack McAuliffe, uh, the New Belgium story, Buffalo Bills, Boulder Beer. And so uh, just uh, the, the visits that I made, the oral histories I recorded resulted in the donation of just wonderful uh, objects from, from those particular businesses and people. And, um, and, you know, when, when that section of the gallery opened, which was in October of last year, October of 2019, and it's open indefinitely, really, um, you know, until, um, until something, uh, you know, kind of major renovation might happen in the museum in the future. But as soon as the museum reopens, if you go, you'll be able to see it and, uh, and to see these things there. So. I was lucky enough to come out to DC for the opening of the exhibit. And I was so excited to see what you had done. But let me just tell you, since you mentioned it twice, I was so excited to see that, that kitchen. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the child's kitchen. Um, it is pretty fascinating to actually get up close. And, and the, the beer exhibit is literally just around the mm -hmm. corner from it. Um, so definitely worthwhile. Do you have a favorite piece in it? I, I think, you know, the best, the most loved piece from the brewing community is uh is charlie papazian's spoon his brewing spoon it's uh it i think it's been a bit surprising to my colleagues at the museum that the the beer world is the most excited about this little wooden spoon that is uh stained from use and i believe he bought it at a, a either a kmart or a, a hardware store in boulder um but uh it's uh you know he used it for many years in boulder as his own brewing spoon. He taught brewing, home brewing classes with it. He notched the, the end of it, you know, to, to help him in, in, in his brewing. And then, um, but you can, t as I like to point out to, to viewers, you can tell from the wear on the, the bottom of the spoon that he is right-handed, that he stirs the pot this way, not this way. And, and, you know, it's that kind of object that the Smithsonian loves to collect. You know, it shows its use. Um, it, it carries its own story in a very visible way. Um, and so that that's a meaningful piece. Um, you know, I can't not mention that um, my my dad donated a tiny thing to this exhibit. My you know I grew up with my dad being a home brewer and um, helping my dad cap bottles when I was seven or eight. Um, and uh, he was a proud member of the American Homebrewers Association from the 1980s onward. Um, you know, really from when it started. And so he donated a little coaster. And so for him to uh, to come there and to you know to see his uh, his little coaster um, next to his, um, you know, Char Charlie Papazian his, is his idol, as, as, you know, many American homebrewers would say that, that same thing. Um, I mean, that, that's very uh, meaningful, too, from, in a personal way. That, that's pretty cool to see your stuff in an exhibit, in a museum oh. exhibit. So you come from a homebrewing family, you're in, in beer history, you're meeting all these people. I have to ask the question, do you actually brew? I don't brew. I mean, I, I like to say I benefit from the labor of others on that, uh, on that respect. So no, I am um, surrounded by delicious beer all the time. And so uh, why brew? I, I'll, I'll study the history of brewing. 
Listen, I'm on the same page. I don't, I don't have the patience for all that stuff. And well, all the well, that was, and I will say I attended homebrew con last summer and if anything would make me a homebrew, it would, it would be going to homebrew con. It was so fun. And, uh, just, it was, uh, I, I'm, I am, I mean, I love to cook and, and, you know, I meet so many brewers who say they love to cook and, you know, there's a lot of poll cross pollination between the world's beer and wine and beer and food. And so, um, I, it's not at all that I don't have interest. It's more a matter of, uh, of space in my, my small apartment and, um, my roommates, one of them being a toddler who takes up a little <laughs> more space than, yeah. Small roommate, yes. Um, interestingly, I, if, do you ever see, because you talk a lot about the, um, crossover with cooking and culture and identity. Um, and you know, I, like I said, I deal mostly with the past and, and you have as well, but you're very much in the present right now. And, um, you're looking at a lot of the stuff before, before your time at the Smithsonian, you're looking at a lot of the stuff, uh, in New Orleans. Do you see, um, when you're, when you're researching modern era craft beer in the United States, um, are you at all ever finding that your past work in New Orleans or in other places is informing what you're doing today? Oh, sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, um, you know, I, I mentioned again, my, my previous training, you know, it's, it's, very, it's stronger in the realms of visual culture and material culture and the idea that um, objects carry histories with them or that um, the visual culture of advertising or, you know, other, other related materials is, uh, you know, carries it, it carries its history very, very strongly. And so, um, yeah, I mean, there's no question that even um, with, with craft brewing today, I mean, if you look at it from a kind of macro with, a you know, from, from a kind of big picture lens, um, the story of microbrewed beer is, I mean, first of all, it's not, it's not solely an American story. The American microbrewers were, were fully inspired by the campaign for real ale in the UK. I mean, this was not our idea at all. Um, you know, there's a kind of transatlantic or global history that is, is fully a part of it. But, um, but craft beer is, is very much part of the, the consumer movement in the, Mar in, in the United States, the kind of do-it-yourself movement, the counterculture, you know, big, big parts of the 1960s and 70s in the U.S., um, beer participates fully in those histories. And, and, you know, I think it's just been, it's not been, you know, it's been neglected a bit um, with relation to, to food or to other angles of it that are just better acknowledged or, um, you know, better known. All right. So your whole, everyone is so impacted by what's happening right now. Right. Mm -hmm. But, um, and we've all had to sort of learn to, adjust, pivot, figure out how we uh, move forward in different ways. And your work is a lot with traveling and meeting with people and collecting things and interpreting them uh, for a public audience in a museum setting. Um, how has your whole initiative had to pivot? What is, what, what's the work now? Right. I keep, I keep hearing the word pivot and I use it myself. I mean, I think everybody in every, in every uh, industry is using this word pivot right now. And yeah, I mean, I, this is my 11th week at home, um, like many of us. And uh, I should have been in Asheville, North Carolina last week. I didn't. Mm -hmm. have, uh, Good town. Uh, right. Um, but, you know, pragmatically, I'm recording oral histories now via Zoom, which works very well. And, you know, I think we're all seeing the the benefits of this in certain respects that um, you know we're able to to have people on our screens who are literally around the world uh, to to meet people in a way that uh, might not have been as immediately available previously. And so last week I recorded an oral history with a, a team from um, East Brother Beer Company in Richmond, California. They came to my attention because I had and I'm happy to talk about this more, but I put out a call for um, for suggestions for donation to the museum related to the impacts of of COVID on the brewing industry. And um, they, they introduced me to this um, really wonderful set of posters that they've created um, to promote a particular beer that they've brewed recently called Pride and Purpose. It's the motto of the city of Richmond, um, but portions of the proceeds go to, to impact a, um, a local relief fund in their city. But um, this poster series that they did, they had this really wonderful idea to feature, um, it's a series of 14 posters, they feature a photograph on each poster of a taproom regular. 
um, and they're beautiful yeah. photos and um, it just it was a, a really nicely designed object and um, you know it appealed to me too because it's it's easier for me to travel around and to you know I could talk to a brewer I can talk to a grower but the, the people who fill the bar stools you know who who you are so interested in your work you know I, I'm I'm equally interested in that as well and so here was a a depiction of these regulars, you know, in supporting the brewery, supporting, uh, you know, at this particular time, which is so extraordinary. And so, um, so yeah, I was able to, you know, sit down with them and, and um, with uh, one of their um, colleagues, Michael Kaiser, Good Beer Hunting, who helped them develop their their brand and their aesthetic and um, and talk about their experiences right now, and just to have a conversation in the midst of something, you know, not and we're kind of we're into it now by several weeks of course and, but to hear you know exactly what's changed in their brewery and you know how their tap room looks different now than it did four weeks ago what they think the future holds I mean, you know those are those are feel very valuable to me as a historian very valuable conversations and so those are things that I um I definitely intend to continue so recording things for sure at home is a way um is a way that that my work has changed. I mean, I can still work for sure with a lot of the things I've collected in terms of, uh, you know, the oral history audio that I'm editing and, and making available um, for for researchers. Um, but, you know, the museum also, of course, we we deal with objects, with tangible objects, and so I know we're all very eager to get back into the museum space and to welcome people back there too. So. Yeah, I I miss tap rooms. I miss yeah. museums. I miss it all. Um, one of the things that you and I often talk about is this whole issue of, of preservation, um, you know, doing research and getting at things and you're studying, again, present uh, era breweries and what's your interpretation? Are breweries doing a decent job of actually preserving their own histories? Um, and then if not, what do people need to do? Yeah, I think um, it's a great question. It's a conversation I always have when I travel, you know, with anyone when I sit down with them. And I just mentioned this in our previous conversation, but many brewers are are shocked to consider that they are I, that they're they are subjects of historical interest now or in the future, and and some keep records, you know, whether it's brewing logs or uh, you know the other you know archive designs of their label art, for example, and others don't. Um, you know, in some clothes, they just, you know, as in your era's past, they junk everything and, and others don't. And so, um, you know, I think the first, the first bit of, of you know, it's a request is, is to be mindful of what you are producing to, to, to organize it and archive it in a way that um, would make it preservable or legible. Um, and, you know, a museum of the future can, can organize things for you um, into an archive. But, um, but just not to discard things. And, you know, I think um, brewing histories is, is something that's really interesting to study because it's a, um, you know, as many brewers like to say, it's a science and an art. It's a, a sensory thing that they're producing. And so, um, you know, there's, there's just this intense interest in kind of um, getting at what something tasted like of a particular era. You know, what was the work like to brew something in a particular era? And so as much as we can do now to preserve um, the history of the kinds of ingredients we're using, but also the processes, the equipment, um, the conditions and the, the tools, you know, the, those are things that will all be very much of interest to people of the future. And so, um, you know, I think as I, as I talk with brewers, but others in the industry, it's a it's a, it's, you know, it's, it's, I'm curious about what they've done so far and it's always an encouragement to do more, to say more. Um, so even pre-COVID, post-COVID, I don't even know what to call any of it anymore. What, um, what's in the hopper for you? What's next with the mm -hmm. Brewing Initiative with Project of the Smithsonian? Well, very, um, Fortunately, the, the Brewers Association, their initial gift was for a three-year position, and they agreed to renew their gift for another three years, which I am deeply grateful for. Um, and so I'm, this is, uh, I guess we're approaching halfway through the, the first of that second set of three years. And so, you know, there, this is a term position, though, and, um, and so there's a bit of a sense of being on the clock and trying to think about, you know, what what is what, what can I do in, in the remaining time? Um, 2020 is the, Smith, the Smithsonian has... Um, has dedicated it as the year of the woman, you know, recognizing the, the centennial of the woman's right to vote in the U.S. And so my 
focus this year has been and in a certain way will be to um, especially emphasize um, women donors and women's voices in the industry. Um, the, the current situation has certainly um, kind of shaped that into a, a, a different kind of course. Um, and so the, the museum, um, all curators in the museum are, have begun a new collecting initiative related to the impacts of COVID on, um, on respective industries. And, and the history, the story of beer right now certainly intersects with many of these, you know, whether it's um, agricultural history or philanthropy or, or food. And so um, curators are now, have all developed new collecting plans related to what is happening right now. And so certainly that has um, taken the front burner in terms of um, conversations I'm having with potential donors, whether it's people I've already, I already have relationships with or um, those who are reaching out to me. Uh, I, I posted my call for donations on the member forum of the Brewers Association and have heard from really um, interesting people just, just very geographically dispersed, which I am very happy about. Um, and so, you know, right now it's conversations when the museum reopens, then the process begins to accept donations, physical donations into the museum. So, uh, but that is, uh, you know, there is just a, a strong understanding that this is an extraordinary moment of history um, and that you know, it is the museum's duty to document it and to do it in a way that is thoughtful and coordinated and not, not rushed. Uh, I mean, we, have, we feel a sense of urgency in terms of reaching out to people, in terms of designing a collecting plan, but, um, but the museum will do it in a way that is uh, thoughtful and, and smart, I think. Sure. Um, I'm going to see if we have some questions here. If anyone has a question for Teresa, please ask in the chat room. Uh, We'll get to some of these before we wrap up. Um, Eric, uh, in terms of geography, spots, uh, geography time people, um, somewhere that excites you to explore mm -hmm. further. There are pockets that of the country that I had not visited yet and that were on the docket for 2020. And those, <laughs> those included um, the, uh, the South, um, I mean, beginning with Asheville, um, but, uh, you know, I think brewing with brewing history, it's, it's easy to give lots of attention to the West coast, to the Pacific Northwest, to the Midwest, um, New England as well. And so, you know, but I did a collecting trip that was Pittsburgh and Cleveland that was incredibly rewarding and, and, um, you know, not to, not to kind of skate around your question, but there are, um, you can go to any part of the country and have, um, just incredibly interesting and, and, you know, rewarding collecting experiences. Yeah, I think for me, the things that excite me the most are places I haven't been. Sure. Yeah. It's so new. Mm -hmm. um, Tim wants to know, do you see modern beer myths emerging? Interesting, Tim. Question. And I would um, actually want to hear what other people think about that, too. I mean, I think, yeah. uh, you know, it's the mythology of microbrew beer in the United States for it to be the history of the scrappy underdog. And, uh, and that's, it's, it's true to an extent that, you know, it, it, um, it's, it was a quixotic project to found breweries in an economy that were, was comfortably dominated by massive mega microbreweries and uh, massive mega breweries. And that's, you know, it's still, it's still true, of course, that 75% of the beer that is sold in the U.S. is, uh, you know, comes from one of those macro brewers. Um, but uh, there's been... I would say a kind of strong sense of self or, or sense of um, mythology or romanticism to, to microbrew beers. Um, yeah. And it's, it's alive and well today as it was in the seventies. <laughs> I uh, am often, it makes me chuckle n knowing people who own breweries and watching them struggle, mm. watching them, you know, it's a labor of love. It makes me chuckle when I hear this is a myth that I, I feel like exists. It's people who are not in the brewing industry, like, gosh, you know, I should just open a brewery and make a lot of money. <laughs> right. What a lot of people said right after the repeal of prohibition, and it didn't turn out very well for, you know, people jumped in who were, who were not brewers and brewed spoiled beer. And um, it's, I mean, it's, it's an incredible amount of work, as any brewer would tell you, and any brewer will say, they clean more than they brew and you know it's uh it's uh it's not to be not to be taken lately so right yeah. um 
John wants to know, at what point in the process do you ask for the donation of artifacts and how does that process work? Yeah, um, I think, you know, one thing that has become very clear to me in my work at the museum is that, um, is that acquiring objects is, is first and foremost about establishing a relationship with donors, with the donor. And you, you, I mean, I, I feel this all the time. You are asking them to part with their most treasured things that tell the history of their lives. And that is a big ask, uh, you know? Um, and so I think, at least in my mind, you know, first it is, it is to establish a relationship of trust and to show that you are, you are, you are taking your role very seriously to understand them and to honor their career and the work that they do and to give them an understanding of what happens when they donate an object, how the museum cares for it, what steps that object is going to take, where it's going to live, you know, when potentially it might be able to go on display. That's something that we could never say for sure. Um, but, you know, I think sometimes people come to your attention at the museum um, because of objects first, you know, maybe you read an interview where someone mentions an object that is, you know, really interesting to you. But I think for the most part, it's more that people are interesting first, you know, their the careers and the stories come first. And then it's through the course of conversation where, you know, maybe during an oral history, people will mention objects um, that seem so significant that then you might follow up with um, with that, you know, in a, a later conversation or, or, or maybe later it's a conversation that is actually, you know, specifically to talk about potential items that have been really significant in someone's career um, that might be able to have a home at the museum. So I think it's different for every donor. Uh, yeah. Sure. Um, what can, we talk about breweries and th th they are the ones who are making and, and should be preserving things and their stories. Is there anything that a lover of beer, a beer drinker, a, a loyal supporter of brewery, local breweries or breweries anywhere can do to inform the kind of work that you're doing? Homebrew clubs are incredibly interesting to me. Any kind of documentation, you know, if you're, if you're a home brewer, if you are just um, a beer lover who, you know, in the course of your travels, perhaps you document your trips to uh, favored tap rooms or, um, you know, your tasting notes. I mean, one of the objects I've collected, and if there is time, I can spin really quickly through some images that I yeah. want to share with you. But, um, but you know, one of the things I collected for the museum was this um, little notebook from um, Jeff Liebisch, who biked around Belgium in 1988 and, you know, kept this little mead notebook where he wrote about all these beers he loved and bars he loved and came home to his wife, Kim Jordan and said, can we start a Belgian brewery in our basement in Fort Collins, Colorado? And that was the beginnings of New Belgium Brewing Company. And, you know, it began with a bike trip with these little notes. And so, um, you know, there, I would not underestimate the importance of, uh, of, of things like tasting notes or, uh, you know, records of travel. Yeah. Sure. Um, yeah, if you want to show us some images. Sure. And I know we're, uh, don't have unlimited time for sure. So I'll do this real fast. But, um, I wanted to show you some examples of um, pre-existing collections and new things I've collected. This is the museum, which is now closed at the moment, so you cannot go there and I cannot go there either. So, let's see. Okay, so, you know, things that, that lived in the museum before I joined, for sure, um, some really rich um, advertising material from the late 19th century, brewing equipment, like on the right, this is a colorimeter from around 1880, 1885, a brewer would place a little sample of beer, a glass of beer on that shelf in the middle of this tool and light would shine through the beer from that little window. And then this outer wheel spins and this is a way for the brewer to assure a particular malt content in the beer to match it up to a, a kind of, um, you know, a preset scale of, uh, of, malted, of malted beverages. Um, signage from from Prohibition era, uh, non-alcoholic tonic produced by Milwaukee Schlitz Brewing Company. But then, you know, as I mentioned, a lot of my work begins with travel around the country to different breweries um, to meet with people. Um, this slide, for example, um, Cleveland, Ohio, Great Lakes Brewing Company, Pike Brewing Company in Seattle, 
Hardywood Brewing Company in Richmond, Virginia, and then on the right is a nano brewery called One Barrel Brewing Company in Madison, Wisconsin. Um, visits like these, uh, this is, these are an amazing network of lagering caves underneath the streets of Cincinnati, Ohio. Um, and then this is uh, Nuclear Brewing Company in the top, the beautiful um, kettles there. Visits like these often then progress to oral history. So with um, Sam and Mariah Caligioni of Dogfish Head Brewing Company on the left. On the bottom right, that's Jack McAuliffe from New Albion Brewing Company. Um, and then the top, um, Ed Bailey and Dave Bracey, they run um, Drinking Partners Podcast, which is a podcast out of Pittsburgh that um, pairs comedy and beer with um, local arts and culture. Other oral history subjects that I've spoken with, Carol Stout, Denison's Brewing Company here in Silver Spring, Kim Jordan, person on the right is likely familiar to you, Natalie Lurzo from Russian River and then Annie Johnson at Pico Brew. Um, these kinds of conversations then often result in the donation of objects. Um, so for example, from Dogfish Head Brewing Company, um, Sam Caligione purchased this vintage vibrating football game um, at a thrift store in, uh, in the early, uh, 19, sorry, late 1990s, 1999, and he rigged it up um, over his boil kettle on the right. This is his original foundation, uh, foundational boil kettle from his Dogfish Head Craft Brewery and used it to continuously shake hops into his, uh, into his boiling beer, um, producing the technique of continual hopping. So when you buy a 60 or 90 minute IPA, you know, this is the game that he, he used to invent that technique. Um, on the bottom or on the right side of the screen, this is the notebook I was just mentioning from New Belgium where uh, Jeff Liebisch recorded his notes when he had been biking around the country in 1988. Uh, on the left, these are, this is from my visit to Jack McAuliffe in Arkansas, uh, lots of clippings he had saved from um, local newspapers in the late 1970s, you know, announcing the arrival of New Albion to the area. Buffalo Bills Brewery and Hayward um, donated the wonderful sidewalk sign. These things are now on display as part of the new exhibit. And then this lineup of tap handles, we, this, this was the original lineup in the bar from 1983 to 1994. And so we, we installed the tap handles in the same order that they, you would have seen them at the bar. And so, um, so if you walked into the bar, you know, the, the lineup you see when you go to the exhibit case is what you would have seen if you were a customer at the bar. These are materials from Boulder Beer. Um, first, uh, first microbrewery in Boulder. Um, this is from the printer's press sheet from the first set of labels um, printed for, for its beer. Handmade wood crate, which is common among microbreweries when they, you know, they were, they were too small to source, um, to source really containers or other kinds of materials to contain their beer. And on the right is a guest book from one of the first days when Boulder Beer was open. You'll notice, uh, pretty eminent names on there, like Michael Jackson, Charlie Papazian, and Fred Eckhart visiting on the same day at this brewery. Um, Michael Lewis, professor emeritus at UC Davis, um, sent his brewing textbook, which this is a good example. This is on the right. These are the photographs he sent me prior to, do to donating the objects. After they get to the museum, they get, you know, a nice professional shot like this. Um, and then this is uh, stalling materials. Oops. Uh, this is an image of one of the newer cases um, that you can see when you come to the museum. And we celebrated the opening. Um, this is what Liz attended with a conversation among Fred, uh, Fritz Maytag, um, Charlie Papazian, Ken Grossman, and Michael Lewis. Um, we grow hops at the museum and um, uh, picked the hops last fall and, and uh, local home brewers we invite to brew beer with our hops grown at the museum. And then just another example of a kind of public program we do is we host these some um, special tours of our archive center. This is the entire brewing team from DC Brow Brewing Company, one of the local craft breweries in DC. I was so thrilled they brought everybody down and you know we spent a morning with them showing them our 19th century uh, materials there. But um, what's happening now, of course, with the current era of COVID, I mean, I'm sure you're, we're already seeing these, you know, material, um, th these things that will, will be the material culture of this time. And so this altogether beer, which is, uh, you know, initiated by a, a New York based brewery, but they've made the recipe and the label art um, open source and, you know, it's being brewed by breweries all around the country. Um, but this is the collecting call that I shared with, uh, with um, 
people on on the Brewers Association forum, and then this is the collecting plan that was approved by the museum. I know it's a lot of uh, text, but you know, the, just the variety of things that that the museum has approved to collect. You know, whether it's hand sanitizer produced by breweries, physical signage, photo documentation, oral histories. You know, it's really a range of things that the museum would be happy to join our collection to preserve this time. Um, on the right, this is an example of the um, the poster that I referred to earlier from East Brother Beer Company in Richmond. On the left, you know, we're, we're open to collecting digital assets too. This is um, part of a digital package developed by the Brewers Association to for breweries to advertise, you know, do, new delivery or curbside pickup for their beer. Um, DC Brow Brewing Company here in DC is uh, selling masks. And then on the right is a beautiful label from a, a brewery out in um, in Washington. Um, they call it this beer checklist, you know, with this idea that checklist IPA, that there's a new checklist that we all have when we leave the house that we need our gloves, perhaps, you know, our, our mask, our hand sanitizer, you know, a, a measure that, you know, to, to stay six feet away from others, um, label art that all re refers to this time. So, um, so those are the awesome. images I want to share. Yeah. So it's kind of a um, range of, uh, you know, from 19th century to the present. Let me look at some of these other questions. Yeah, um, real quick, we'll get to Lucas's question since he's referring to some of this uh, uh, material. Mm -hmm. um, how do you archive and exhibit digital content as breweries, among other sectors, with the digital recipes, communications, et cetera? We have digital archivists at the museum who are helping us with these questions, but and we are we are able to preserve digital assets, um, not at a level that I think the that we all want yet we're getting there but um but it's uh it's definitely possible yeah how does social media um play into into some of the the work that right. you're doing yeah it's a great question i have not been collecting that yet um and uh and i think it's i mean it's a very loud voice in the brewing industry right now to the to the pleasure and dismay of some brewers um but uh it's not something i've been collecting yet but it's uh it's something that is should be considered for sure with the help of these digital archivists. That would be a, a intense strategy to figure out how, how you extract some of those voices because there are many. Yes. Um, from Tim, have you talked to others in the Bay Area who are important to the counterculture of food drink movements of the 60s? Yes. yes. And um, interestingly, a little tidbit that came out of my oral history with Ken Grossman, he said that Chez Panisse, Alice Waters, famous restaurant in Berkeley, um, she was his first restaurant account for Sierra Nevada Pale Ale. So the first time Sierra Nevada Pale Ale went on a restaurant menu was at Chez Panisse. Um, Alice Waters and others very much of this movement have a relationship with the museum already. Uh, my colleague, Paula Johnson, she's a longtime curator of food and drink history, and she has, she has very thoroughly researched the, the history of, the, of California cuisine and the good food, move, good food movement in California in this time. So, um, so me collecting to beer is, is, you know, just drawing links to pre-existing collections that are, um, that are definitely very healthy at the museum. Yeah. Awesome. Um, all right. If no one else has any other questions, um, I'm going to let Teresa get back to her small roommate, <laughs> the toddler. Uh, and, and, and to the rest of, of your day. Um, I always love talking to you. Um, I'm a big fan and, of you and your work. Um, I so appreciate the fact that you're such a great partner to the Bruseum and a great supporter and are always willing to contribute in so many different ways. When we co-produced the Beer Culture Summit that we hosted um, last it was fall. You, let's, we'll be honest about that. It was, it was lit. <laughs> But, you know, having your support and, and having you be a part of it, it was really kind of a, an amazing experience all around. And uh, we really appreciate um, the work that you're doing, not just for contributing to what, what we're doing at the Bruseum, but overall, because a recording uh, what's happening right now in, in the beer era is so important, not just to beer, but to the whole story, right? Beer is the American story, American history overall. Um, with that, make sure you guys follow Teresa on uh, Twitter, Teresa McHugh. Uh, check out the um, National Museum of American History's uh, Brewing Initiative uh, page, where you can learn more about that actual work, uh, what's happening over there, see links to the exhibit. And by all means, when we are able,
get over to DC and check that exhibit out and, and see some of those awesome collections. Thank you all very much for joining us. Um, next chat is Thursday. Uh, this Thursday, um, we are talking about the Conrad Site Brewing Company, which was the largest brewery in Chicago during the late 1800s for a time. And Secret is out. It's coming back. It's coming back this year. Um, and we're going to be talking to uh, a historian who knows the story well, uh, the great, great, great granddaughter of Conrad Seip, who is reviving the brand and to Tracy Hurst of Metropolitan Brewing, who will be making the beer uh, for Lauren. Um, Teresa, thank you again, as always. Yeah, thank you, Liz, and thank you, everybody, for, uh, for spending your time here. It's wonderful to see your, your face. Have a great evening, your rest of your week, everybody. See ya. Cheers.